Hey guys, so in this video, we're going to be talking about opening principles and basic ideas that you want to follow as you're going through the first few moves of the game. And the first three, I'm just going to outline them right now, are one, controlling the center, two, uh, developing your pieces, specifically your knights and your bishops. These are the main ones that you want to develop. And then the third thing is that you want to get your king safe. King's safety is usually, what we mean by that is castling, and you'll see what I mean in a second. What I mean by pawn center and trying to put your pawns in the middle is you're trying to put your pawns in one of these four squares, and you're trying to use your pawns to control and maybe attack those squares. For example, if this pawn move happens, you can just take the pawn and the point is that this pawn on d4 here is working to kind of guard this square. Same thing with the pawn on e4 is guarding the square on d5. So if you might, for example, say like this opening, if at some point white can push the pawn, now white has pawns that are closing in a little closer to the black king and a little deeper into the black position. This is black's half of the board, this is white's half of the board. When white pushes a pawn further into the black position, black has what we call more space, because, well, they have more pieces in the opponent position. And when, the opponent, or when we have more pawns in the center and more space in the center, we can usually do something called, well, there's no specific term, but kind of like cramping the pieces. So, for example, this minor piece, this knight, cannot get out to this square. These, this bishop cannot develop to these squares. So gaining space in the center is very helpful for hindering the opponent's development, uh, blocking in the opponent's pieces from getting out in an easy and comfortable way. So now we're going to go into just an example opening, which is uh, an opening that I play personally. And it is called the Italian. It comes from e4, e5. And basically, Black's idea is to try and contest this pawn from pushing forward and invading too deep into the black position uh, by just blocking in. White then brings out a knight. This is what we call development, where you bring out your minor pieces. And this way is very good because you actually attack the pawn at the same time. So you force your opponent to react. Black does not want to play something like d6 because you're not actually getting your minor pieces out in any way. So this is not something that you want to do. Instead, what's better is if you play something like knight c6, which defends the pawn, but it also develops your minor piece at the same time. You want to be as efficient as possible in the opening. So now white plays an interesting move, bishop c4, which aims to put some pressure on the king, which is still in the middle of the board. And you're just about to see what I'm talking about. So let's say bishop c5 trying to do the same thing. Bishop's putting pressure on this pawn. White actually castles here. And what does castling do? Well, castling is the probably the most important aspect of king safety. What you're doing here is you're actually using these pawns as a so-called shield. What these pawns do is they act like thorns in front of the king. Earlier, if you look at the king here, there's nothing in front of the king, which means it's pretty exposed. But when you castle, now all these pawns are acting as guardians for the king, and this rook is also starting to protect this square, and the rook can also start to um, activate and try to put itself on a file, uh, on a, these vertical lines that we call files, and starting to put pressure along this E file here. So that's what castling is for. Black can actually play knight f6 now, though, and black is also readying himself to castle here, and at the same time is developing a piece and attacking a pawn, which is a very effective move. White here plays knight c3, point of it being that you're defending this pawn with your knight and developing another minor piece. As you can see, both sides are prioritizing development, and black now castles. White now here, for example, is an interesting idea. If you play d3, the point is that you can open up this bishop because earlier the bishop had no path and could not develop, right? So when you push a pawn, 
This pawn now defends and solidifies the center, now the center is rock solid, but at the same time, your bishop can develop to an active square, it can go to d2, it can go to e3, it can go to g5, right? It has much more options now. Black also plays d6, trying to do the same idea, getting out their other bishop that wasn't able to develop before, and now bishop g5. And what's interesting about this move is that it actually indirectly protects the center. Why does it do this? Well, in this case, this knight is actually putting pressure on these d5 and e4 squares. For example, if the knight moved out of the way and it, if this pawn pushed, the knight is able to attack the pawn on e4, which is the whole point of putting the knight here. It's meant to attack and threaten the center. When you put the bishop here, you're actually able to put it in a so-called pin so that the knight cannot move, right? Or else you lose your queen. And that means that the knight loses its grip over the center because it is in this pin, it is immobilized. Meanwhile, white is not pinned. So maybe uh, we'll, we will stop here, but maybe black will try to do the same thing. They'll try to pin or, for example, they could play h6 and try to kick the bishop away. They might, for example, kick the bishop away, kick it back to d2, and now there is no pin. Right. So these are the basics of the opening. The opening that I chose was the Italian because it's a very straightforward opening. It's a great beginner opening. Um, the whole point is that you're developing your pieces all around the center. You're always trying to put your pieces in a way that they can support these four crucial center squares. As you can see, all of these pieces, all of these minor pieces are aimed at these four center squares, except for the bishop, which goes out to g5. But even here, it is indirectly fighting for the center by getting rid of the opponent's, uh, the opponent's attacking piece. So that was just an example to outline some of the principles I was talking about. Now we're, I'm going to send it over to Millen, who's going to talk about opening principles from a different perspective. Hey guys, so like Daniel said, I'm going to try covering openings from a bit of a different perspective. Um, as you can see on the board, we have d4, um, which goes into my opening, the Queen's Gambit. Um, the Queen's Gambit is uh, a different setup than um, something like the Italian. Uh, as you can see, there's an early um, pawn sacrifice involved to uh, actually fight for a further like solidification of those opening principles. So. As you can see, um, after d4, d5, c4, white is uh, giving away this pawn in exchange for uh, the full center. Now, black normally plays e6, um, and the reason for this is that if black were to take, then after e4, white gains this big, strong center and um, will generally have a very good game after that. So um, going back into the main line, we have e6. Um, this is called the Queen's Gambit declined. And the way that development generally follows after these moves are um, knight c3, uh, knight f6, and I personally take on d5. It's just an exchange. And uh, after e takes d5, we have bishop g5. So um, after some fairly standard development, we have bishop g5 right away pinning the knight to the queen. Um, this pin is contributing to the center, similarly to in the Italian, where um, as this knight is immobilized, these two squares are then um, under further control by white. So black generally responds um, with bishop e7, guarding the knight and breaking the pin, um, which again mobilizes this knight once again to control the center. And now um, after e3 to solidify the uh, d4 pawn, and c6 to solidify the d5 pawn, queen c2, um, developing castles, um, which is important for king safety, bishop d3, uh, knight to d7. Um, you can start to see kind of the opening plan for both sides come to fruition. Um, black has uh, somewhat developed to their liking. They're now going to reroute that knight to g6, and um, on the other hand, we're going to have white fighting for the center with a little bit of an unorthodox move. Um, normally, in these positions, you see knight f3 and um, castles, and that's fairly standard. The knight controls the center, 
castling gives uh, king safety for white, but in this case we're going to try something else, which is actually knight to e2. Um, and the reason that this is a little unorthodox is because it's actually a um, different way of fighting for the center with a pawn break, um, which will come to fruition a few in a few moves. So after rook to e8 um, and castles, we have knight to f8 again um, with the idea of bringing the knight to g6 um, and completing black's development while opening this bishop up. And now we have um, f3. So f3 is a very unorthodox move. Um, it's generally frowned upon in a lot of openings because it compromises king's safety. But in this position, white's king is relatively safe and um, playing the um, pawn, move pawn to f3 is not very big of a risk. Um, and the idea of pawn to f3 is actually to play e4 and get a full center. So after a couple more moves, you have knight to g6. Um, rook to d1, finishing development, the rooks are connected, supporting the center. Uh, we have bishop to e6, and now um, h3. It's just a um, preventative move. You don't want any um, future threats of the knight coming here. Um, and now if black were to play a move like a6, or in this case rook c8, now you have e4. And um, white's opening plan is complete. As you can see, um, despite the f3 pawn being pushed, their king is relatively safe. Um, the development is complete. All the pieces are contributing to um, supporting this pawn chain, um, grabbing central space, and um, black or white has now taken the full center uh, with pawns on e on d4 and e4. So after an exchange of pawns like this you can see that white has a very pleasant position. They have full center, completed development, and castling. And uh, from here, white can play into a relatively advantageous uh, middle game. So now that we've gone over the basic opening principles, I'm going to put those principles into action with some blitz games. And um, yeah, I'm going to play this time control three minute, two second increment where I get two extra moves, uh, two extra seconds per move, and we each have three minutes to play our move. So it's going to be a pretty fast game. I'm going to start in the center. He's also attacking the center with what we call flank pawns. Flank pawns are the CNF pawns. Very common approach. This way he preserves these two main center pawns while um, utilizing this pawn to control the center. Now he's attacking the center like this, we've both developed pretty quickly. He plays d6. Okay, now I'm going to play this move. Um, this is called the Richter Rouser attack. Basically, I'm going to be attacking this knight. Oh, he attacks my. He attacks my knight. Did not really expect that. Okay, I'm going to drop my knight back to b3. I think what he's going to try and do is play knight g4. But the problem with that is I can just play queen e2 and defend my pawn. And sure, my bishop will be losing a little bit of development, but I can get castled very early. His king is very long ways off from getting castled here, because both of his bishops are a little bit limited. Okay, e6 looks kind of wrong. Um... Yeah, e6 looks very strange because I can just take this. Um, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt because it's actually in these kinds of positions it is common to do this and compromise your structure. You do not want doubled pawns usually, but when you take towards the center, it can be justified sometimes because you'll have more pawns facing towards the center. In this case, maybe it is justified. Now I'm going to castle this way. Again, common idea in the Richter Rouser. Um, playing against, well, the Sicilian, as you may remember. This is called the Sicilian defense, and I played into a Richter Rouser attack to play against that. Okay, a5 looks, a5 de definitely looks wrong. Yeah, now I can just completely lock down any advances his rook is not getting active my rook is already active because it's putting pressure on this file okay i'm just gonna drop back probably oh and actually i can drop back here 
and attack the queen at the same time. So that's good. Yes, yeah, queen comes back. Okay, he's gonna probably try to play d5. Bishop e2, probably? Yeah. Okay. This looks super dangerous for him, actually, because... Well, I'm just going to be pushing my pawns, and he cannot. Basically, what I'm doing now is I'm going to start pushing pawns. When he starts taking my pawns, uh, my rooks will become very active very early. He plays bishop d7. Probably aiming at my pawn there. Not sure the exact intentions. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure what that did, so I'm just going to play this. If he pushes to it, open up an attack on my pawn twice, I'm just going to play f5. Or g5 even. And attack his knight. He's... Okay. I'm still not too sure what he's accomplishing here. I might... Okay, I, I think I might see what his idea is now. I'm going to play g5 first, though. Yeah. Kick his knight back first. Yeah, oh, he goes to e8. That's... Okay, I might just play king b1 now. His idea, I think, is now to play knight b4, and if my knight moves up, well, <laughs> I guess not. So, I guess his idea is now to go into c4, and so that he can attack this pawn. Which is reasonable. Um, let's see, what do I do? Maybe I should just keep pushing. I do have to be very careful um, because he's starting his attack earlier than I thought it would happen. Um, he's starting to activate his rook. Rooks end up activating later in the game. Uh, in this case, he's activating it like this, which is kind of unique. I might just play this. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want this rook to stay active, so yeah, now I have to take the knight off the board, and then I'll take here, and I think he just blundered because I have this check. Because the bishop cannot block or else I just take the bishop, and otherwise I just take the rook, right? Yeah, so he attacks my rook, I gotta move it somewhere. Yeah, here. Um, Alright, so he's trying to be a little kind of active here. Obviously, he's trying to throw me off with more attacks. This is what you should be doing, by all means. Um, trying to complicate things, but I think this is just winning now because I'm going to be undermining this pawn, and as you can see, when you push all these pawns forward, what ends up happening is um, Black's king gets very compromised. His king safety is very, very bad now. And I think I can just take this, and queen f7 is a threat. Queen f8 is a threat. I do not think he is going to survive for too long. Okay, I'm going to give a check. This knight is a good piece, though, granted. Um, yeah. Okay, I think it's made now because, yeah, he resigned. If his knight comes here, then I'll just take And The bishop's also guarding h8. The pawn is guarding h7. Yeah, so I'm going to turn this over to Milan now. He's going to play his own game, which is probably going to be a different opening scenario, but following under the same opening principles of, you know, pushing the center, developing your pieces, getting your king to safety early, and keeping your king safe. Um... And yeah, we'll see how it goes. Turning it over to you, Milan. Hey guys, so I'm just going to follow up on Daniel's game by um, going through my own thought process and um, showing you how I approach the opening and then conversion to a middle game. So we're starting with d4, uh, like I explained earlier, and we're going to go into a queen's gambit. Uh, Black responds with e6. This is actually, um, now it's called a triangle system um, or a semi-slav. Um, black fortifies the center with these three pawns. Uh, it's very solid, very difficult to crack. Um, and now we play into a full-fledged semi-slav with bishop g5. As you can see, 
my knights, and uh, my bishop with this pin are supporting the center. Black has his own very solid center with um, pieces supporting this knight, um, controlling those squares. And as I continue to develop, you'll see how each of these moves are um, in some way contributing to controlling these center squares. And now we castle. Um, our king is safe, and to an extent, the um, an opening is complete. So now uh, I play c5 in response to this move, and the idea of that is to, well, shut down this push. Um, now we can play knight here, using that central space to grab as much as we can, improve our pieces. I have this open file, or semi-open file. And I'm just looking for advantages, ways to um, coordinate my pieces and create play for myself. So, rook b8 is a fairly strong move. Um, I think that my plan is going to be to put pressure on these two weak pawns. So I'm going to go knight here, and the immediate threat is to go knight here. But if he takes, and I take, I'm now hitting both of these pawns, and supported by my pieces in the center. So black response with c5. Okay. Now, this does um, allow me to take, but after rook here, I don't believe that that is good for me. So I'm going to take, and I believe play rook c1 to fortify my center further. Okay, he doesn't take back, that's smart. Um, why don't we go like this? We're guarding the knight setting up some discoveries. This position's pretty dangerous. We can start with rook c1 to kick the queen. Okay. So we have ideas here we can we can take or we can bring our rook in. this. So the rook's being hit, bishop's being hit. Okay, there we go. And now we coordinate very well in the seventh rank, hitting both of these bishops um, with the eventual threat on black's king. Um, I have a huge space advantage, and this is very difficult to hold for black. Okay. Alright, so I have a couple of ideas here. I can go here, and I believe this is just actually checkmating. Uh, so that's kind of how I approach moving from the opening to the end game, uh, or to the middle game, and finding weaknesses in your opponent's position um, right away. Uh, I hope that this was instructional, and um, that's going to be it for this video.